come on, let's just do that again. Come on, let's give him our best praise from the bottom of our heart. God, you're worthy. Come on, just say, Jesus, you're worthy. Come on, Jesus, you're worthy. None can compare to you. None can compete with you this morning. God, you are worthy to be praised. You're worthy to be honored and adored. How many are grateful that you came to church this morning? Come on, somebody. Man. Can we just, can we welcome our Rising Sun campus right now? Come on, we welcome you guys. Our Middle River, our Nairobi, those watching online from home, right where you are. I just believe that God is able and capable of meeting right where we're willing to meet him. And today, I just feel like, man, the church showed up today to be in the presence of God, man. I I just love it. Thank you, worship team, for leading us so well in all of our spaces today. Come on, last week was amazing. Over 40 people got baptized, went public with their faith. And I don't know if you know this or not, or you can feel this or not, but since the new year, man, the church has exploded. It's craziness, craziness. And new people are just professing Jesus to be the Lord of their life. And then I'm telling you right now, God is doing revival. It's not that revival is coming. We are living right in the middle of it. And I'm just grateful to be alive to see it. Come on. Aren't you grateful? Awesome. Well, as you're standing, if you have your Bibles, I want to take you to a passage of Scripture that I believe is so foundational for a Christ follower. In fact, this is a passage of Scripture that has been so special in my heart ever since I said yes to follow God and and to be involved in ministry and um, this is not just the scripture that, it, that we're just going to read. It's going to be transformational. I just really believe that we'll forever be marked by this passage today. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to go to the book of Philippians chapter 3. And we're going to be reading from verses 10 through 14. If you have it, say, I got it. If you don't have it, we'll wait on you for just one more second. Or you can join with us on the screen. People are saying I got it just so that I'll hurry up. That's not funny at all. No, I'm just so Paul writes that I may know him, that I may know Christ in the power of his resurrection, and in sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained this. Or am I already perfect? And I just want to stop here. Is there anybody thankful that God doesn't use perfect people? Right? How many are grateful that perfect people don't exist? How many are, if you think you're perfect, I would say that you're probably at the wrong church. And honestly, if you think you're perfect, I would suggest that you're in the wrong faith. Now, there might be a cult for you, but this is not one, right? Can I get a good amen? Holler at your boy. Or just a little a- a- elbow. But Paul says, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers and sisters, I don't consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining. I love this word, straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Come on. I want to talk to you guys today on this simple topic that I have decided to follow Jesus. Come on. I have decided to follow Jesus. Now, from the jump, what I'm about to share today, it does not come from a religious or theological theory. What I'm going to share with you is what's been transformational in my life and I will say today that if you give Jesus your heart he will transform you from the inside out is there anybody that believes that today all right so let me pray father I thank you for this day I thank you for the presence I thank you for the atmosphere because where you are there is perfect liberty and today I pray that we would forever be marked by this word And God, let us leave changed and transformed. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. You can be seated, but you got to tell your neighbor that they look amazing. 
You look amazing. The new year is looking good on you. I have decided to follow Jesus. What I have discovered is that religion equals burden. I will say that again because someone asked me to say that again. What I have discovered is religion equals burden. Religion, this idea of religion, the concept of religion, our feeble attempt to get to God results in religion is burden. Because religion has no power to transform the soul. The end result of this idea called religion is this. Is that we do what we want to do. We live the way that we want to live. But then there is this God figure up in the sky. Somewhere watching and waiting to catch us in our failure. So living in the idea of religion the shadow of religion, God becomes a burden to us because we have not yet been transformed from the inside out. And this God life, this church life, this spiritual life, it becomes a drag, it becomes a weight. It's the last thing that we want to do. Getting into the word is not something that we enjoy. Spending time in prayer is not a default for us because it now is such a burden. In fact, there are probably some of us today that we would rather be fishing in 10 degree weather than being in church. Maybe we would rather be golfing. And I would say I sometimes would rather be golfing. But I'm not, I digress. But if we're not careful, church life, God life, spiritual life can become religious. And because God is a burden... We live this substandard life, and it's an awful way to live. Religion is a burden, but a relationship with Christ is a blessing. A relationship with Jesus is not a burden. It is a blessing, and here is why. Because Jesus actually has the power to transform our soul. Jesus changes the want to in my life. I don't have to, I want to. I don't have to, I get to, I can. And this is the transforming work of the gospel. For those of you that are new to church life, for those of you that have just recently professed Jesus as the Lord of your life, this is the foundational teaching of the gospel. We, in fact, we sing a song, Come Alive in the Name of Jesus. I'm talking about resurrection Power. This is what we believe in. This is not God just sim- simply making us better. This is God making us brand new. We are alive in God. This is the journey of following Jesus. Can I get a good amen? A- somebody. A grunt. Anything will do at this point. It's a blessing. And it's not only a blessing to my soul, it's a blessing to my life. It's a blessing to my future. It's a blessing to my family. It's a blessing to generations. And I, here's what I know. I've never met someone who has lived their whole life for the Lord. And just as they cross over into eternity, have they ever looked at me and said, Pastor Wade, man, that was a waste of time. I've never experienced that ever. Because people who really know Jesus love Jesus because to know God is to love God. And here, if we're taking notes today, here's my first little point that I want us to grab. Come on, let's write this down. That God can be known. That you can know God. Paul writes, that I may know him. Like, I want to know him. Paul declares this even though he's now been serving Jesus for decades. And Paul is actually writing this under house arrest in prison, pinning these words. I want to know Christ. Even though he's in jail right now for knowing Christ. Like, how can he say this? He can say this because God is so high and so wide and so deep. He's an everlasting God. He's the Alpha and the Omega. And this makes my brain hurt that there's never been a beginning with God and there's never going to be an end with God. He just is. That there is this countless well that I can drink from about the knowledge of who God is. I'm not just talking about head knowledge today. 
Because you can have the whole Bible memorized and, and still declare, I want to know God. And I would say that you can have the whole Bible memorized and not know God at all. Because I'm not talking about knowing about him. I'm talking about truly knowing him. Now, as Americans, we know stuff about a lot of people at an intimate level, in fact. And those people have no idea that we know that. Because of Instagram. Because of Facebook. Because of all the episodes you watch and follow. Like, you know about people... And they, and it's weird, it's freaky how much you know about people. <laughs> and they don't know you at all. I was thinking about this and it reminded me of a story when I was just a, a small young lad. Middle school, elementary school, our school took us on a field trip to the Mall of Malls in Houston, Texas. It's called the Galleria. If you've ever been to Houston, Texas, you know what I'm talking about. It has like an ice skating rink. Now we couldn't afford to go into the, any of the shops, but we could hang out on the cheap side of the food court. Because every food court has a sabero, you know, some pizza place. You know what I'm talking about? So we're hanging out. And all of a sudden, one of my buddies look up. He's like, oh, my goodness. There is Warren Moon. Now, Warren Moon was the quarterback of the Houston Oilers. Now, that's when Houston had a team. And they double dog, triple dog dare me to get out of my seat and go introduce myself to the quarterback of the Houston Oilers. Now, what, if you know anything about me, you would know that I don't do that stuff now. And I surely didn't do that stuff then. Like, I don't want to be known by anybody, in fact. But you can't dare your boy. So I jump out of my seat. And I go stand between Mr. Mr. Warren Moon and the exit. And it was on that day that I got dissed by the quarterback. He's like, son, get out of my way. And that was the day that the Houston Oilers died in my life. And I don't care if Tennessee got them. Like, good riddance. I did not have a football team after that. We know a lot about people, and they have no idea that we know them. And if we're not careful, we will bring that right into the church, and we end up knowing things about God, we end up knowing things about Jesus, and we become a fan rather than a follower. Are you with me? We end up knowing a lot of things about him. We sing some songs about him, and we, maybe we read some verses, but we don't know him intimately. And I would say today that the invitation of heaven is intimacy and not knowledge. And what Paul is calling us into is into a knowing of God, a knowing of Christ. And this word literally in the Greek language, to know Christ, it means to learn. It means you become a student to know and to be known, it is to understand. And I would say that understanding grows in God's word, but intimacy grows in obedience. And Paul is saying two things happen when I know Jesus. One, I experience the fellowship of his sufferings. That sounds amazing. But I also experience the fellowship and the resurrection and the power of his resurrection. Knowing Jesus leads to suffering and resurrection. And it's possible that some of us will never experience either the fellowship of his sufferings. Now, let me just say this about suffering. God will not put on you, God will not put on his children what he took on himself on the cross. God does not put on us what he took on himself on the cross. The Bible says that he took sickness on the cross. It's with his stripes that we are healed. That he took poverty on the cross that he became poor so that we could become rich he took sin on the cross he 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 became a curse for us on the cross so he doesn't put those things on us and you're like Peter I'm struggling with an addiction but I think God is actually allowing it for my good and I would say no he's not because God never gave you that addiction Or, Pastor Wade, I've got a disease, and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and God's really, and I would say, no, God doesn't give you disease either. Because you wouldn't give your kid a disease, and there's no one in this place that's bigger and better than God. Are you with me? So we talk about the fellowship of suffering, and we say that, I'm talking about the fellowship of his suffering. What was his suffering? It was rejection. 
If you think the church is going to win a popular contest in this culture, you've got another thing. Think you got a you got another thing coming for you. It was misunderstanding. How many have ever felt misunderstood? You're like, well, you're the pastor. You should never be misunderstood. What? I'm the most misunderstood person in the house. I live on a hamster wheel of misunderstanding. I'm in a tornado of misunderstanding. Like, just my office alone causes misunderstanding. I might get a letter after this sermon today. That's what I'm talking about. And if you send the letter, put your name on it. (laughs) Or it's going in the trash. What was his suffering? It was trusting God's will versus his will. This is the suffering of Christ. And here's my point. When you really know Jesus, church, you will enter into the fellowship of his suffering. Yes, there will be misunderstanding from those that are closest to you. There will be persecution. And it's possible that some of us will never experience resurrection power because we're not willing to enter into the suffering with Jesus. And this is why that we can walk away from the faith. We can walk away from church life. We can walk away from some relationships and say, ah, I'm just not sure if I experienced God or not. I'm just not sure if that just wasn't my emotions involved. I just was, I'm just not sure if, if the church is the right place for me because the church will hurt you or it's an abusive place. And I will say sometimes that is true, but oftentimes it's not. It's just that you didn't experience the resurrection power because you weren't willing to experience in his suffering. My point is this, that we want resurrection, we just don't want a cross. We pray for resurrection without crosses, and we wonder why there is no power in the resurrection. And Jesus said, in fact, he said, that if you're going to follow me, you've got to count the cost. Well, welcome, y'all. Welcome. Welcome. Let me say this, because Freedom Church is not a doom and gloom church. Suffering with Christ will always lead to resurrection power. Always. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus said, anything you give up for my kingdom, anything you give up, guys, I'm going to give back to you 100-fold. So there is a giving some things up. But anything you give up, Jesus is saying... I'm going to reward it 100-fold. There is always blessing in obedience. So there, yes, there is this initial give up that hurts my present, but it pays dividends for my future. And what I know is that we all have an enemy, a spiritual enemy, the devil. And the devil will try to get us to count the cost of right now. Because the immediacy of obedience is not usually a Christmas gift. The the immediacy of obedience is is usually not a blessing. In fact, the immediacy of obedience is usually persecution and misunderstanding. It's delayed gratification. And it's the exact opposite of our culture because our culture says if you want it, you can have it. And if you can't afford it, just go into debt for it right now because it's yours. And the kingdom principle comes along and it says, hey, be wise and be patient. And as Christ followers and new Christ followers, you will always encounter a tension. There is a tension in living God's way. And the enemy will try to get you to count the cost of following Christ. And he will say and try to convince you that there is no cost following the enemy's way. In fact, this is what happened to the children of Israel in Numbers 11. They said, we remember the fish that we ate in Egypt, and it was for free. For free? Another translation says that we used to eat it at no cost. Really? No cost? I mean, it was just 400 years of slavery. It was 400 years of abuse. 400 years of family separation. 400 years of humiliation sexual abuse, 400 years of day work and night work for free. They said we used to have cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlics and we had all this stuff. It was so good and it was for free. It was like this big golden corral. 
And if we're not comfortable, if we're not careful, the devil will tell us that there is no cost for doing things our own way. And I just want to remind the church today that there is nothing that's free. If it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. You have to count the cost. And there is a cost to following Christ. It's called misunderstanding and persecution. There is a cost of doing things your own way. And the cost is far greater. And it offers no resurrection power. There is always a cost. You just have to choose your cost. The cost of success or the cost of laziness. Both have a cost. The cost of living on a budget or the cost of living in debt. They both have a cost. The cost of living a dream or the cost of living in regret. The cost of being a bold risk taker and the cost of living in fear. The cost of submission. The cost of rebellion. The cost of getting up early and the cost of living your whole life in a frenzy. And I promise you, that 30 minutes isn't worth it at the end of the day. The cost of staying in a marriage or the cost of divorce. The cost of being generous or the cost of greed. The cost of becoming a victim and believing a lie or living in the tree of life and freedom. The cost of servanthood or the cost of selfishness. They both have a cost. The cost of pride or the cost of humility. They both have a cost. You just have to choose your cost. Can I get a good amen somebody? If Israel would have trusted God in the wilderness, there was a promised land waiting for them. It was a land that the Bible says flowed with milk and honey. It was a promised land that God said, I'm going to give you houses that you didn't build. I'm going to give you wells that you didn't dig. I'm going to give you vineyards that you didn't plant. I'm going to bless you if you trust me in the wilderness. If you will trust me through the persecution, I will bless you. If you will trust me through the misunderstanding, it, there, I will, there will be a blessing. If you don't quit in the suffering, because church, there is always a resurrection on the other side of whatever cross you bear. Knowing Christ, it leads to resurrection power. Most of us, we don't suffer for God. And most of us, we will not experience the resurrection power that only God can give. Because if we're not careful, we'll know a lot about God, but we don't really know him. Paul is saying, in prison, being in prison for knowing Christ, he said, I want to know him. Now, let me get to the second point, because it's a bit heavy in here, and that's not how we're going to end. Can I get a good holler at your boy? Write this down. Your past is not your end. Your past is not your end. Paul says, forgetting what lies behind me. This means that forgetting is a spiritual discipline. It does not mean that it leaves your memory. It just means that it leaves your heart. <laughs> In fact, you may never forget fully. But you will forget to the point that it no longer dictates every decision that you make. Paul says, forgetting what lies behind it could be past shame or it could be past success both limit us from what God has in our future because we can get stuck in a season and the devil says hey because of your mistake this is what life will always be or it was really good back then so it will never get better we get stuck in a past season and we never enter in what God has for us in the future Paul says I've got to forget that I've got to make the decision to lean into my future. Listen, learn from your past, but don't be mastered by your past. Our past can teach us, but our past is not our prophecy. Your, I, I, I just feel led to say this again. Your past is not your prophecy. Good or bad, don't be limited by it. Blessing or pain, don't be limited by it. Great season or terrible season, don't be limited by it. Because if we're not careful, we can let one moment prophesy our whole future. Well, I guess it's the way it's always been, so it's going to be the way it's got to always be. No. 
Your past is not a prophetic voice in your life. I got a question. Did anybody become a food hoarder when COVID was announced? <laughs> let me see your hand. Everybody, be honest. Come on, let me see your hand. All right. Here's a better question. Have you cleaned out your pantry? And did you know that all of that food is expired by now? Like all this food would have been good for us in its season. In its season, it was great. In its season, it brought nourishment. In its season, it brought health. But now, it brings sickness. And hopefully, you're not feeding your kids year-old tuna fish. In church, in the same way, you have to know the expiration date of your past. Are you with me? you got to know when that thing's gone. Well, how do I know? Because it's past. And if it's in your past, it's past. Stop eating from yesterday because it's making your soul sick. That food was good, but it's no longer good. And in the same way, your past might have been good. It may have taught you some things, but it cannot become the prediction for everything in your life. My past is my teacher, but it's not my master. My past may instruct me in some areas, but it's not my Lord. In Psalms 43, God says, you've got to forget the former things. Like, don't dwell there. Like, don't get a P.O. box there. Don't build a house there. Don't live there. In fact, the former things that Isaiah is talking about here were all good things. And like for the first 17 verses, God is saying, man, this is how I delivered them. This is the good things that I did for them. Here's all the great things that I did. And then he says, hey, but don't live here. Because if we're not careful, we'll get stuck in a past victory. And we'll have no strength for today because we keep thinking about the good old days. And you know that the devil has robbed you. If the only gleam in your eye, the only skip in your step, the only bounce in your voice is when you talk about your past. I've got to remove that. I've got to embrace my present and I've got to embrace my future. Can I get a good amen, somebody? All right, here, here's my third point and final point. Short and sweet. Your future is bright. Your future is bright. Now, I know this is deep today, but your future is bright your future is bright now I know we're conscious because over the last few years we were a little bit insecure to even say amen to what I just said because I just said it four times and I did not get one amen I count it because in this current cultural climate we can lose our excitement for the future we can lose our joy for our tomorrow. We can lose our optimism. And here is what Paul is doing in prison. Here is what Paul is doing under house arrest. Here is what Paul is doing when his hands are bound in change. He says, I am pressing on. I am leaning in. I am straining towards. I am excited about where God is taking my life. And we would look at Paul and say, Paul, you are in jail. What can you do in jail? And you're like, Peter, don't tell me to be excited about my future. Like we've got wars going on right now. We've got weird hot air balloons floating around the sky. We've got economy issues. We've got a lot of uncertainty. All I see is negative. Don't tell me to be excited. And I will tell you, by the authority of God's word, what Paul is saying here, he's like, I'm leaning in. Better days are in front of me. God's working. God's moving. I may not be able to see it right now, but I know it's coming. I know it's coming. I have predecided to follow Jesus. And there's no turning back. Because church, we are a people of hope. If we have no hope, we have nothing. We are a people of resurrection power. We are a people of future. We are a people of destiny. We are a people of tomorrow. Amen. And Paul would go on to write 2 Thessalonians, the book of Colossians, the book of Ephesians, the book of First and Second Timothy, 
the book of Titus, and possibly the book of Hebrews. This moment did not steal his future, and this moment will not steal our future in Jesus' name. Amen. In closing, the bank can come. I, I, I came across this article, and this is so interesting, and I, I, and I believe this is just a word for our church. But according to a New England Journal of Medicine, they have now found the decade of your life where you're most productive. How many would like to know the decade of your life where you're most productive? Would you just raise your hand? That'd be pretty awesome, wouldn't it? Are you ready for this? The decade of your life where you're most productive is between 60 and 70 years old. Turn up. <laughs> 60 and 70. The second most productive decade is 70 to 80. The third is 50 to 60. And I know, I hear it. You're like, this is crazy. Here's why. Because in your 20s and 30s, you just think that you're being productive, but you're not. You're just busy. You're just active. You're tired. You're doing weird projects. You're on Instagram. Like seven hours a day, you're on social media. You're watching your kids play video games. You're a taxi driver. You're living in a fog because you have toddlers running around you. And you think you're being productive, but you're not. You're actually just active. The majority of pastors who pastor the largest congregation throughout the world, they are over 60. The average age of a Nobel Peace Prize winner is 62. You're like, Peter, why are you telling me this? Because I want you to hear me, and I want you to hear me loud today. Your future is bright. Your future is better. That God has a plan for your life. And the most years of your productivity are still in front of you. Paul's years of most productivity was in front of him. He didn't let what was happening steal his lean in into the future. Come on. Let's all stand, everybody. You're like, how do I ensure this future that I want? How do I get excited about my future the way Paul got excited about his future? And I just want to close with this one little thought. It's a powerful thought, I believe. In Exodus 23, 30, God says, the way I'm going to move in your life is little by little. Little victories. Little steps. Little moves. Church, you just keep showing up. You keep showing up. And I would say that the secret behind every success story that I know is that they, they just kept showing up. They kept showing up. You're like, I, I don't pray a whole lot, but you can pray a little bit. I can't read my Bible very much. I just don't understand it. But you can start this week just, just reading a little. I feel like my marriage is disconnecting. But this week, we're going to little by little realign our marriage to the heart of Jesus. I feel like I'm losing with my kids. But this week, we're going to turn it around. And just little by little, we're going to realign our heart with our children with the heart of God. God says, what I'm going to do in your life will be little by little. It's going to be slower than what you think. And I want you to catch this, church. You, you grow into your purpose. Church, you grow into your destiny. You grow into your future. You don't just wake up one day and all of a sudden you grab a hold of your destiny. You grab a hold of your future. No. You, if you never get big enough, you'll never be able to step into what God has for you. Because there's a size that you must be to possess it. And this is encouraging. This is amazing because it means that I can grow. It means that I can increase. It means that even if you don't like your life right now, you can grow into the life that you desire. But the life that you require and desire requires growth. It requires a lean in. It requires a pressing in. It requires a patient press into the future. And little by little 
by little, I step into it. And as I step into it, I realize Jesus was already there waiting for me to step into it. And he's calling us. He's calling us into better. He's calling into his best. Church, we have decided to follow Jesus. I want to pray for us this morning. I woke up super, super early. In fact, it was so annoying how early it was. And I'm tired. But this burden was on my heart, and, and I've been asking our staff, like, can, let, this year, let's realign our heart with the gospel. Come on, let's throw the nets every chance we get, because if we lose the transformation power of the gospel, we lose it all. And I want to pray, I want to invite Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. Maybe you've never trusted him for the forgiveness of your sin. I want to pray for you this morning. Maybe you're saying right now, Pastor Wade, I want to know him. If people misunderstand me, I still want to know him. If I am persecuted, I still want to know him. If people walk out on me, I still want want to know him. I want to know him in every area of my life. I want to know him in the fellowship of his suffering, and I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. I want to know Jesus. Come on, I want you to pray this from your heart. And I would say everybody should pray this prayer. Because if you pray this from your heart, God will heal you. He will hear your prayer. Come on, just say, Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I believe that you died for my sin. Jesus, I believe that you rose again just for me. And I want to know you. This morning, I give you my life. I give you my mind. I give you my will. I give you my emotion. Jesus, I trust you. And I declare today that Jesus, you are my Lord and you are my God. You are the Savior of my life. Come on, can we just say amen to that? Can we celebrate? Can we praise God? Come on, we are moving into our future. We have decided to follow Jesus. Come on, let's give God some praise this morning.